Hey everybody out there, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. You're in my corner and I have a very special guest in the corner. Would you like to unveil your secret identity? My name is Adam Bobro. Shh, don't tell. But you just did, like you just... You well, just... No, I did, but oh, okay. I don't want you to, because that it worked out perfectly, actually. You asked me to introduce myself and yeah. I mean, fair enough. Awesome. Yeah, that works. <laughs> So this is your first time on the show. Um, so one of, I, I know you get asked this question all the time, anybody who's in acting. But I, I love to ask the very first time, what sparked your interest into acting? Oh, well, um, I think just making people laugh from a very young age, uh, whether it was something unintentional or maybe I tried to make someone laugh in kindergarten. And I was just like, wow, it's a really cool feeling to bring the best out of people and see them in their happiest state and sort of give that to people and feel like you're responsible for making the world around you a happy place. Um, so for me, entertainment period was just sort of exciting. And then acting was just sort of a cool way to get to essentially play pretend, but not let people know and, you know, make believe and challenge yourself to do it as convincingly as possible and make yourself believe. And in the process, take people on a ride and, yeah, I guess the entertainment factor, the performance factor is pretty high for me. So would you describe yourself as maybe a class clown or a theater kid when you were growing up? Well, I was, I think class clown applies, but uh, as far as theater kid goes, I was actually a jock until I met a, and jock is also a funny term, I played sports, um, played baseball, basketball, and soccer growing up, and then met up with a soccer coach in high school that, was not my favorite person and I just decided you know what I'm not going to play soccer when I have to play for this man so I was taking theater class for fun and the theater teacher kept asking me to come out for the school play and I kept telling him now I've got sports and he said well what if you don't make the team and I was like well I'll make the team and my school wasn't outrageously competitive um so yeah, my junior year of high school, I came out for the school play instead of playing soccer and ended up getting the lead in the play, and that late, it ended up leading to an agent, um, and that's how I started acting professionally. Wow, that's that's great that it was just from from high school into an agent. That's that that feels very rare. Yeah, it was uh, it was fortunate, and I see I know there are some real dog chasing the tail type of. Uh, catch 22s to get into the union and get into the industry so it was fortunate that it was relatively quick and sort of a fluke no congratulations on that that's really cool i always like to 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 ask that because you know there there's that question that comes up all the time you know how'd you get into acting or how'd you get into voice acting or how do i become a voice actor and it's like i just point to the beginning of every interview i'm like there's their journey it won't be the same for you <laughs> Ooh. Well, the funny thing is the voice actor part of it, I was just answering the uh, the on-camera, I guess, part, but the voice actor part is actually probably a better story. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Was, it a, was it a drunken night with a monkey? What happened? <laughs> um, actually, I've never really, I've never really been into drinking uh, with or without monkeys, but I will say that I, in college, I was in college and our school would do this thing where... Sometimes the coffee shop would shut down early without being advertised, and we had a meal plan that was no rollover, and I felt like, you know, that was sort of stealing from the students. Um, so one night the machines went down, and I noticed that they couldn't really keep track of what we were spending, and so I ordered about, I guess it was $1,800 worth of food from the coffee shop. Oh, and, my God. Yeah, from a coffee shop. And most of this is like boxes of Altoids and you know, frozen pizzas and all sorts of junk. And I donated $1,500 to a charity out front on a step called Feed with Flex, which is where people use their meal plan to give their leftovers. Mm -hmm. And then with the other $300 worth of food, I put like frozen pizzas and stuff in the fridges of my friends and myself. Um, and I thought everything was fine and dandy. And I was like, ha, got the school back for all those times they stole from me. And then, um, the next morning, I found out I couldn't get breakfast and realized that I had been charged $1,800. Um, so I had to work that summer two minimum wage jobs, one of which was at Blockbuster Video. Um, remember that? <laughs> yes, I do, actually. I found awesome. my Blo Blockbuster card the other day. 
<laughs> oh, nice. Um, you should make a necklace out of it, like a slave <laughs> style, and put it on a gold chain and just frame it. That'd be. They awesome. are kind of big, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, and and it'll be a fun thing for everyone over the age of like eighteen or I don't know twenty five or however old you have to be to really appreciate that to appreciate it. But um, yeah. So I worked at a blockbuster video and a movie theater. And when I was at the movie theater, um, I used to do funny recordings and I overheard the outgoing message and it was like, thank you for calling the Calabasas Stadium 6 Cinemas featuring giant <clears throat> giant wall-to-wall -wall screens and dynamic digital sound. And I thought, wow, that's sort of sad, <laughs> like voice cracks, reading mistakes. So I went into my boss and told him, I said, hey, uh, so, Bob, I heard that, you know, the outgoing message, and if you need someone to record it, I'd be happy to do that. And he goes, yeah, that'd be great. We've never really had anyone to do it. I said, yeah, I don't know who the 13-year-old was that recorded it, but between the voice cracks and the reading mistakes, I figured it wouldn't hurt to offer. And he <laughs> said, Adam, that was me. <laughs> oh. And I was like, Bob, it couldn't have been you. I mean, there were voice cracks and reading mistakes, and you're, you're like a grown man with a full goatee. You're 50, right? And he's like, Adam, I'm the only one who's ever had the password. And I was like, well, I'd be happy to record it if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, that was a real foot and mouth moment. But um, oh, that's so good. That's yeah. so good. <laughs> so he basically let me come in that Thursday and record. And it started off like, thank you for calling the Edwards Calabasas Stadium 6 Cinemas. And then the next week was like, thank you for calling the Edwards Calabasas Stadium 6 Cinemas. And then the next week was like, thank you for calling the Edwards Calabasas Stadium 6 Cinemas featuring giant wall-to-wall -wall screens and dynamic digital sound. And then I started like getting into character voices and doing accents and little kid voices and grumpy old men voices. And just every paragraph of writing was something different. And I had fun with it every week. And people started calling just to hear it and laugh, not for the actual information. And it ended up getting on the news. And after that, um, I ended up getting a voiceover agent who I've been with for about a decade and a half now. That is pretty fantastic. So it goes to show, you know, you you can get get that sort of thing in very odd ways. I, I'm I'm yeah. glad that your boss was a sport about it, though. Me too. Yeah, that's. Uh, I guess it does go to show that even if you get in a really sucky situation, that sometimes you can make the most out of it. So. Yeah, it worked out pretty well for me. You yeah, know, congratulations on that. Thanks. I mean, if I was that boss, I'd be like, you get out of here. <laughs> you know, you raise your hand, just get out of here. Exactly. Um, but <laughs> for, the, for the fans out there, um, one of the interesting things that I, I found about your career, because you mentioned you were a jock, is you were super into ping pong. Like, not a little, a lot. Um, it's it's one of the major features on your website. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, something. It's funny how sometimes the things you do with like your parents. You know, my mom and I play Scrabble regularly. Uh, my dad died in I guess 2007, but my dad and I used to play ping pong on the driveway a lot. And I don't know. I guess I just played it recreationally like most kids and like a lot of people in the United States play it for fun at home or, you know, at an uncle's house or on a cruise or, you know, people play beer pong or whatever. But my dad was better than anyone I'd ever seen. And I ended up it's a bit of a story, but I was playing with a tennis ball with my brother on a ping pong table. My dad was like, Adam, don't play with the tennis ball. You're going to break the racket. And I was like, yeah, right, dad, watch this. Bam. And hit it as hard as I could. And it cracked the paddle in half. I was so embarrassed. I went to buy a new one and I bought the most expensive one in the store. Cause I blatantly disobeyed my dad. So I spent $13 on it. And, uh, when I showed it to my dad, he said, Oh, the one you broke was like $2. You didn't need to get such an expensive one. Uh, why don't you use this as your primary racket and it'll be part of the family collection. And I said, well, what makes it different than the others? And he showed me how to spin the ball. And once you learn how to spin the ball, it just changes everything. Um, and so I just wanted to play more and more. And within a year, I got like a professional racket that was $100, which is sort of low end for a professional racket. But it was my first. Um, tried out for a team at 14 years old, didn't make it. Um, at 15, I tried out again and made it and practiced a lot and ended up getting some medals. And I don't know, I've never really enjoyed being told what to do. 
um, or having to answer to people. So I didn't really like being coached. So I improved much slower than most people who do train. Um, but over the last 20 years, I've only grown to love the sport more and more. Um, and while I've improved very slowly, I've gotten to a decent enough level that I've been, you know, sponsored and travel internationally competing. And after that video that's on the front page of my website, um, that ended up on, you know, like some TV shows, Tosh.0, ESPN, and a bunch of other stuff. And even internationally, people started inviting me to other parts of the world to entertain because they saw that I was a character. And while my style is, you know, I have 12 year olds around here that can beat me. Um, so I'm not the best player. It's fun for the spectators because I don't always play the smartest shot, but it might involve me diving, jumping over something, spinning, or hitting a shot, you know, 30 feet in the air that ends up coming down on the table, something like that. So, yeah, it's a sport that I love and love. And actually, as far as table tennis and the voiceover world, there's been a nice marriage of that as I uh, recently became the voice of table tennis. So I'm a professional commentator for the last little over two years now. So, yeah, table tennis is a big part of my life. You know, that's really interesting. You explain like all the, I guess you'd say stunts that you do. I imagine that, that some of the people sitting at home like, oh, that must not be that hard. And I'm like, oh, that must be really, really hard to do. You know, you must have a lot of stamina for that. Oh, well, compared to the pros, like the actual pros, I am just a like a wet noodle. I mean, they can play forever and they just in practice before matches, they do things that are so physically exhausting. Um, when I'm on the world tour, sometimes... I don't have access to play because the professionals need the tables for actual training and I'm so much worse than most of them that it's not like they'll play with me for fun if they're out of the tournament. Um, but otherwise I'm no help to them. So yeah, sometimes I'll try to do the workouts that the pros do. Like this girl from Singapore, Yu Meng Yu is really thin and she's probably about five foot six. I'd guess she's about a hundred 15 pounds but she's muscle she's just really skinny um and if you looked at her you'd think yeah that person's not especially strong i tried doing her weak workout after an injury with her and felt like okay yeah this is good i feel a good burn here so even though i outweigh her by a bit and i'm you know six inches taller than her so from a stamina standpoint i guess compared to a non-athlete i'm in okay shape but compared to the uh the pros i definitely have my work cut out for me <laughs> Well, you also teach ping pong, too. Isn't that uh, another service you offer on your website? Yeah, um, I'm doing it less and less, um, mostly because commentating and being gone a lot. Like, I actually coach at a middle school on the other side of L.A. one day a week when they're in school. Um, I'm doing some library programs right now. Actually, later today and every day this week, I've booked different libraries to go in and sort of get some kids excited because I think it's an amazing sport and most people in the United States aren't really exposed to it as a sport. And I think the only thing, well, maybe not the only, but a big thing stopping the sport from growing is lack of exposure. It's just people aren't aware that it can be played as more than just something to do with your uncle or dad or, you know, brother or sister in the garage, you know? Yeah, no, I could agree with that. I mean, the last time I even saw a ping pong table, I was like six at a boys and girls club. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, they seem to have a lot. Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA seem to have them, but there are actually over 60 different like clubs in Los Angeles and Orange County area that are table tennis clubs where you can go in and find a bunch of people playing on several tables. And a new one just opened that I'm probably going to check out tomorrow. But yeah, they're popping up all the time. And Spin, the ping pong night lounge that's down in downtown LA, they have all over the world. Susan Sarandon is... Uh, sort of the face of that but it's a really swanky bar with the dj and cool lighting and yeah good specials and attractive people walking around picking up the balls and leather couches and black lights and people can go there and play so it's definitely getting more and more in the public eye in a cool way it seems yeah it sounds like it but for the fans out there that want to keep up to date with your ex you know your your adventures and everything else um i know you have a youtube um, and where can they find that? Well, the YouTube channel, um, just at Adam, I guess, Adam Bobro, so B-O-B-R-O-W. Um, but I, the thing I'm really updating the most is my Facebook. Um, between international adventures and, you know, silly interviews 
series, like I have an interview series I do with the professional players called Ask a Pro Anything, which the main goal of that is to sort of bring out the personalities and allow fans to connect directly with their favorite players and like them for more than just their style of play, but maybe because they realize, hey, we both like the same band or we watch the same TV show or we're fans of the same team or, wow, that person's so quirky and funny, I had no idea. Um, I post most of that on my Facebook, which if you go to adambobro.com, my website, there is a little Facebook icon at the top. And I have a fan page, but I really don't use it as much. I use my personal page. And, you know, for anyone who can't add me as a friend because it, it just doesn't allow it anymore, uh, I guess following is fun enough. People can still message me and comment. It's all public. And, yeah, the adventure is much more thorough there from stories and shenanigans to silly pictures to table tennis action and entertainment around the world. Yeah, and all your social media, as you said, is up on your website, Twitter, Instagram as well. Yes, I'd say my Facebook followed by my Instagram are the ones that I update the most. And yeah, just in case anyone doesn't know how to spell it, Adam, B-O-B-R-O-W dot com. You know, I, I couldn't get into in, into Instagram until like uh, recently, and yeah. I, I now I'm addicted to it. <laughs> Yeah, it took me a while, too. I, I feel like like Snapchat for me, and this probably dates me a lot, but I just I got it because someone wanted to share a picture that wouldn't last. <laughs> and um, other than that, it's sort of like, I don't know, how many new social media, we'll see. Maybe Snapchat will come around to, but Instagram was the last one that I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll take the dive, I'll give it a try. And now, like you, it's I'm updating it regularly. Yeah, you know, I haven't gotten to Snapchat yet because I, I archive everything and Snapchat is like against my my instinct of like saving things, right? Because exactly. it's gone in 24 hours and you're like, well, what what would I just want to see within a 24 hour span? What if I want to see it later? I can't. It's gone. Right. I mean, technically you you could, you know, but like mm -hmm. I, I feel like if you're going to make video content, YouTube makes so much more sense um, because you're archiving something there and it lasts let's assume it lasts forever and nothing on the internet necessarily will last forever. Who knows? YouTube might go down tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> a meteor hits the earth and we're knocked off our axis and people are like, but YouTube's still here with Twinkies. Yeah, there you go. YouTube just, that's, that's what they're going to have in all of their, their, uh, their YouTube studios, just a bunch of Twinkies and they'll let in like their, their creators and everyone else can go somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a great movie idea actually. It's almost similar to Zombieland, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, no, definitely. But I, I can totally sympathize with that. With Instagram, it was kind of fun because I, I don't know if you get into it, but I get into, like, the different apps and filters and everything. Like, uh, you know, even when you're taking, like, a screenshot of, like, a landscape or, like, a new place you're going and not just people, I like yeah. messing around with all that, like, artistic stuff. Yeah, I think the beauty of uh, the development of cell phones is that all of us can become sort of amateur layman photographers. Um, you just see something beautiful, a reflection on water in a field somewhere, and you're like, whoa, and you can just pull out your cell phone and capture some pretty high quality. I mean, it's not the same as obviously something with a big lens on it, but relatively high quality picture. And then with all the filters, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to try and make your pictures as glamorous, exciting, and stimulating for your viewers as possible. Yeah, and I know they recently changed, like, the size allowments, but they used to be just a square, so you really had to, like, make sure you framed what you wanted correctly or else you were cutting something off. So, you know, it, there's a learning curve there that was kind of fun for me. Yeah, it's so funny you say that because I was, for the longest time, I was taking every picture on square, and one of my friends was like, you don't have to. I was like, no, for Instagram. She's like, no, you don't have to. They allow different shaped pictures now. And I said, really? I, you sure? And she's like, I've been doing this for, like, six months You've never heard of this? I said, no, you're the first. So now some of my best pictures are more landscape and a bit wider. And Oh, something cool on Facebook right now. If you put up a panoramic picture, have you seen this where it'll give you the 360 so you can sort of roam and wander? Oh, no, I haven't, actually. I, I Okay, this is how bad I am. I just found out I can do, like, a panoramic, like, uh, six months ago on my phone. I've had my mm -hmm. phone for, like, two years. <laughs> Yeah, well, try using a panoramic picture and uploading it directly to Facebook and then check out what you posted. It'll be almost like virtual reality in the sense that people can wander around within your panoramic picture 
I saw a friend do it and thought, holy crap, how'd you do that? And uh, he said, I just uploaded a panoramic picture to Facebook. That's it. And it's worked like a charm ever since. So some of my coolest pictures from like overseas or, you know, last, I guess, two days ago, I was in Korea and uh, there was this view of Central Park and Songdo Incheon. And it's the type of thing that was like, wow, I wish people could be here so they could just turn left and right and look at how wide and cool and beautiful this is. And the panoramic with that new feature really accomplishes that. I must be Facebook going like, we're going to push the Oculus more. <laughs> yeah. No, they're doing great. Uh, one other thing that I discovered, someone told me, you know how it's, I guess on Snapchat or other things, people will hold their phones straight up for a video. Yeah. If you turn it sideways, I guess for landscape or whatnot, you get the wide screen shot. Um, the video quality will be higher, especially when viewed on a computer. So I always turn sideways now to take video because it won't put up the black bars and it'll show it in its full form. Yeah, that one I definitely do because, um, but it, it, it's funny. I had a, I'm going to pick on one of my staff members. Um, I had someone who was so used to their phone and we have actual HD cameras we use at conventions and they were turning the camera up and down to film wide shots. Oh, rough. And I was just like, you know, it took me until the second day to figure out what they were doing because, you know, everyone's running around with the with their head cut off. And I'm just like, what are you what are you doing? Like, it was so confusing to me because it's an actual camera. I have more experience with it. <laughs> but it's, they were like, well, I was trying to get the wider shot. And I'm like, no, not like that. Yeah. I can't do anything with that. Yeah, I've, I've had that before as well. It's going to be tricky. Yeah, it definitely can. But uh, for the for the fans out there, um, is there any other projects that you have coming up? Maybe any other events where they can meet up with you? Oh, um, let's see. Events where they can meet up with me. Um, I guess on Facebook, I'm not too private about stuff. So I try to let people know where I'm traveling and when. It's usually international. Um, so most of the work I do with, you know, commentating is overseas somewhere. And I'm actually planning to move to Taiwan Oh, around, wow. Yeah, around December, which would be a big life change for me. But it's sort of a unique time in my life where I don't have to be living anywhere to be working. And I'd really love to learn Mandarin. So, yeah, Taiwan's a great place. Good on you. I wanted to uh, try taking classes for either um, Korean or Japanese. And my family kept pushing me. They're like, you should learn Mandarin. I'm like, that is so hard. <laughs> well, it's funny. In voice acting, it's like whether it's voice matching or other things, I think it calls on aural skills a bit. Um, and Mandarin is, you know, harder in the sense that it's a tonal language. But I think like anything else, if you immerse yourself and you work at it, um, you can learn it. And, you know, I guess between voice acting or just being able to hear, you know, different stuff... Uh, so far, I've picked up a little bit, and I don't speak much at all, but just in the table tennis community, there's so much Mandarin being spoken. Um, internationally, like almost every country has a Chinese player on their team, because if you're not one of the top, say, 20 in China, you're probably not going to have a, a really lucrative career, but you could immediately go to another country and be one of their top three players. So a lot of you know Chinese players do that. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, for the for the fans out there, though, since we're nearing the end of this interview, I was wondering if you'd be willing to participate in a 91.8 The Fan tradition. Sure. Fantastic. We basically ask everyone whether they're a voice actor or not if they'd be willing to do a radio bump for us. <laughs> sure. Awesome. We ask if you could say, hello, my name is, you insert your name, I do this, you can put whatever you want, and you're tuned into... 91.8 The Fan. Okay. If I mess it up, I hope I get a second take. <laughs> you, you do. We've had plenty of people mess it up before. That's the fun part. <laughs> okay. So whenever you're ready. Hello, my name is Adam Bobro. I commentate and play table tennis. I am a voice actor, and you are tuning in to Radio 91.8 The Fan. See, that was perfect. You didn't even mess up. All right. <laughs> Look All at right. you. I think obviously this is this is a career that you should be 
take very seriously. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> well, for the fans out there, is there anything else you want to let them know? Any any words of wisdom, dating advice, uh, predictions oh, for the end of the world? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm going to be single for the rest of my life, but I'm not opposed to it in theory. Uh, I don't know. Date if you want to. Get married if you want to. Have kids if you want to. I don't think people should feel pressure to do things because others want them to or... Yeah, live your life. Don't be ashamed. Uh, be proud. Live boldly. Live fearlessly. Be kind to other people. Please be kind to other people. Give the benefit of the doubt. Um, and really go for what you want. Don't be afraid. Don't settle for a job that you hate. Work for less money and do something that you love and just make your life inexpensive. You'll be much happier that way. Um, if you want to do something, don't think about it forever. Just do it. If you want to be a film director, make films, direct films. If you want to be a, you know, musician, make music. Just the more you do something, the better you'll get at it. Other than that, who knows? I mean, whatever works for you. I don't have all the answers. Um, but yeah, uh, I wish everyone the best. And if I can help in any way, whether it's inspiration through social media or, you know, direct contact, whatever, don't be shy. I'm friendly. Don't bite. And, uh, thank you, Jackie, so much for having me. No, thank you no, so thank much, you. and I think uh, I think we all kind of agree with uh, you know those those last few statements to do what you truly enjoy. Yeah, awesome. And, yeah, thanks so much. And for any of the fans out there that missed any of this interview, don't fret. You can find it on the website within the next few days. So keep your eyes peeled to 918thefan.com and your ears tuned to 91.8 The Fan, where we play everything you want and nothing you don't.